gets wrong. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, all men. We're talking about choices today, but I just wanted to start, I really hadn't planned to say this, but when I was back in Ohio where I grew up in Columbiana, uh, my home church was Jerusalem Lutheran, which in, in, in my day, which, you know, 50s, 60s, uh, was rocking and rolling and has been on a steady decline. And I actually did a little assessment there about three years ago and talked to a lot of people. And it was a discouraging word. Uh, they couldn't, you know, they had a temporary pastor, uh, a lot of concerns. I won't go into that. But uh, somehow, some way, God led them to someone, a pastor, who was already working in hospice and had a whole different ministry but missed preaching. So her name was uh, Karin, Pastor Karin. She's actually grew up in Germany. But she's the pastor there now on a very part-time basis. And as I went around the church, everybody's happy. She's making visits, preached a good sermon. And so I just thought, thanks be to God, because here was a little church that I was afraid was was dying. And I really believe that God has, has helped it. So uh, just wanted to mention, we have some people from Jerusalem. Good job. Keep it going. And as our friend Leonard says, sometimes all it takes is mention Jesus a little bit out in the way, invite one family, invites another, or stop and bring your neighbors to church, right, Linda? <laughs> uh, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Be kind, be loving, invite people, make those choices to help the church, which helps God. Uh, there's a quote, and, and I, when, I, when I came across this, I thought, hmm, but you can only find out what you actually believe, actually believe, rather than what you think you believe, by watching how you act. Now, there are a lot of people who quickly say, I believe, without a lot of thought. But if you look, okay, the last year of my life, how do I act? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, I believe in Jesus. Not that hard to say. How have I lived the last day, month, year, 10 years? And then the end of the quote was, you simply don't know what you believe before that. You are too complex to even understand yourself. So there's a little bit, a lot of that, like it's easy to say, I believe. But the gospel is, yeah, we do fall short. But when we look back, think, how am I living? Am I sharing the faith? Uh, am I giving my offerings and tithes? Am I inviting people to church? Am I doing, like Stacy read, am I the neighbor that passed by? Or am I the Samaritan who stopped and helped? So uh, that's just kind of an overall quote. What do you believe? Well, the, maybe the best way is look at the fruits of your life personally. It's so easy to look at the fruits of somebody else. He said, I'm sorry, I'm pointing over here, but you're just in the way, Scotty. <laughs> it's so easy to say, now she comes to church, he comes to church, but, you know, you should see, you know, should see them on Monday morning. You know, it's easy to do that. What's harder to do is, how about you showing up at church and how do you act Monday morning and Tuesday night? And look at ourselves. That's what we believe. All right, so kind of three choices. The first one is between good and evil. And this begins at the beginning, as, as Stacy read. Third chapter of Genesis, right in there. We know this, this narrative. Uh, we find a theme of choice, the choice between listening to God good choice, or listening to other voices, often evil or the devil. So this, this Genesis 3.8 resumes the episode of the man and woman after having eaten the fruit from the tree of, good, of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. It was a choice they made. It was in direct violation to God's command. Because of this choice, their eyes were open to their state. They realized they were naked and they clothed themselves with, they didn't have any new things from, I don't even know what the stores are, Macy's or Kohl's or whatever. They just had fig leaves. So they put fig leaves on. That's what they had. And because of their bad choice, really the world was changed uh, forever. Uh, there's another little statement here, just another quote that kind of highlight this. And I, I thought this was interesting because there was failure there in that choice. But failure is the price we pay for standards. Now, we live in a world where there are some people that say we shouldn't have failure. People shouldn't be allowed to fail. They shouldn't be allowed to flunk. They should just bring everybody through. According to uh, this person, failure is the price we pay for standards. Why? Because mediocrity has consequences, real and harsh. So living a mediocre life, if you were put through school or never really came to church and 
You think mediocrity, that's okay, God loves me the way I am. There are consequences for being mediocre. You're not going to be a very good farmer. You're not going to be a very good teacher. You're not going to be a very good wife or husband or little kid growing up. Uh, so standards are important, and some people will fail. But that's okay. That's how we learn. And we think of that, of course, with the Ten Commandments. So anyway, back to the Genesis. But the Lord called the man, where are you? And then, uh, what have you done? It was that woman. <laughs> How about it, guys? It was that woman. She did it. Yeah, come on, guys. Point to it. <laughs> uh, when faced with a choice, will we listen to God or another voice? So uh, choices. Uh, Leonard mentioned Gunner, his son. Uh, some good choices coming up. You know, good here. I, I know from Leonard, one choice could be made here, but maybe the choice he wants is a couple months away. So what do you do? You make, you pray, you make a choice. I think of everybody that graduated uh, from our church or anywhere, you get through school, you know, whether it's, uh, I saw on Facebook that one of our beloved members who moved on, Trey Subert, is already in Crane uh, operations, so he's running a crane. You know, I thought, good for him. That's a, that was a great thing. He he made a choice to do that. Others are going to nursing school. Others are doing this or that. But we make these kind of choices. We do it in everyday life. All the great stories of the Bible, as well as stories from books and so on, show a choice. Make a choice. There is evil lurking. Uh, I believe it's better to face the dragon. Whether to, rather than wait in fear. Better to face the dragon rather than wait in fear. And this, this, this is a story, uh, God bless Jake uh, Jr., but this is not a bike trip from 50 years ago. This is, I've told this, but it was from the trip 12 years ago now when I was biking across the southern tier, which is basically San Diego to St. Augustine. That's the short way. That's, that's cheating. It's only 2,800 miles where the next one was 30 or 4,500. So I'm in Texas, southern Texas, a couple miles from the border, and I had no place to camp, so I saw this. I knew there were a lot of border agents. Back then, border agents were, no, I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I knew there were border agents, and I knew there were big farmers, and I didn't want to cause anybody problems. So I thought, I'm actually going to pick my bike up, not leave a wheel, because there was kind of dirt along the road, very rural, walk back into the woods, and quietly got, I didn't even put the tent up, didn't light a flashlight ever, but I was just going to secretly sleep there, mind my own business. So somewhere around midnight, I noticed a car stop. It'd be like a car stopping on Mud Flat Road at midnight. It'd be a little suspicious. And, and they, two people got out of the cars, and I thought, immediately, it's like we do. What did I do wrong? Is that an irate farmer who somehow had radar out there and he knew I was there? I didn't know. That was like the dragon. So should I have jumped up and faced it, or should I just be quiet? I chose to be quiet. <laughs> but he drove away, but I had this feeling this wasn't the end of the story. So about 20 minutes later, there were three cars, and they all stopped. And about five people got out, and they're like <coughs> 60 feet away from me. And I'm back kind of in the brush. And they all had really good flashlights. Not these wimpy, but really good. And they got closer and closer, and one got within 10 feet, and I thought, i got to face the dragon. I said, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And one guy said, put your hands up. So I put my hands up, and all these guys all descended on me with their flashlights, so I thought, maybe I shouldn't have faced the dragon. And then one guy started laughing. And, and what he was thinking was, oh, it's just an old white guy, you know, <laughs> camping. They were looking for uh, illegal immigrants, and they thought I was one, and they swept the side of the road smooth right before dark, and they saw my footprints in the sand. That's how they knew I was right there. And so after that, of course, my heart, maybe that's when my heart went out of rhythm. <laughs> But it was scary there for a minute because I thought I rate farmer and, I was, and it turned out the guy stayed around for like 30 minutes and uh, I, you know, of course we got talking and one guy asked, he wanted a little marital advice and I said, well, I'm probably not the one to talk to about that. But, but anyway, we, we were friend night when they were ready to go, I said, what should I do? I said, oh, you just stay there. We'll let everybody know you're here. But that's kind of a, a funny story. I mean, it was scary at the time. But I thought of that when you face the dragon, it's just like when you're a kid or 
you know, you see a lot of movies where shall I look at the drag, or yeah, I hear a noise, should I go out there or huddle in the back? And a lot of times it's like, maybe I'll die, but I'm going to face the drag. I'm going to find the problem and see what happens. So that's what we do. So the first choice between good and evil, good and evil. Second choice is whom do you serve? Whom do you serve? Now, Roger couldn't be here today, but we have Jerry and let's see, uh, uh, who's from the class? This, Tim uh, here. Uh, here's the song. Who else? Oh, yeah. Any, any of you. Any of you. Older, but not too old. <laughs> Who wrote the song, uh, You Gotta Serve Somebody? You Gotta Serve Somebody. I'd sing it, but uh, you're thinking about it. You want a multiple choice? The Eagles, uh, the Beatles, or Bob Dylan? <laughs> Bob Dylan. And uh, <laughs> good choice. If you remember the song, uh, something like this, you may be a construction worker working on a home. You might be living in a mansion. You might be living in a dome. You might own guns. You might even own tanks. You may be somebody's landlord. You may even uh, own banks. But you're going to serve somebody. Yes, you're going to serve somebody. What may be the devil, this is a secular song, you know, you remember it. Or it might be the Lord but you're going to have to serve somebody. And here was a song, the Bob Dylan age, that really said something very true and very biblical. You, get, you can't just say, I don't believe in God, and think you're free. If you don't believe in God, you're not free. <laughs> you're going to be controlled by a power much more malicious. God's not malicious, but very malicious, and it's going to trick you, who's going to think you're going the right way, but you're going the wrong way. Go ahead and eat the apple. You've got to learn stuff. You know, take bite, share it with your husband. I don't blame the women, really. You know, come on, we know better. Could have gone either way. <laughs> but you're going to serve somebody. So uh, the lesson in 32nd chapter of Exodus that uh, uh, Stacy read, and I, I was thinking about something else, but just prior to that reading, we had read about Moses going up to the mountain to receive the, the tablets of stone or, the you know, the Ten Commandments. So Moses left, and he heads up in the mountain, God tells Aaron, he said, uh, if there's a dispute, go to Aaron or her if there's a problem here. So Moses left for 40 days and nights. Okay, that's a long time, 40 days and nights. But the thing is, <clears throat> uh, things happened fast because the Bible said almost immediately they proposed to Aaron in Exodus 32.1, come Make gods for us who shall come before us. I mean, they didn't even wait to the 39th day. It was like day one or two or three. It was like people sort of need to follow somebody. They want a leader. Moses went up. Maybe he's coming back. Maybe he's not. And so Aaron, being strong, of course, said, no, no, no. We've got to serve the Lord your God. That's not what he said. You've already heard of Stacey read. He said to Aaron, this was later, when Moses came back, he said to Aaron, Why did, what did these people do to you that you led them to great sin? Do, you not, do not be angry, said Aaron. Don't be angry. Don't, you know, don't blame me. You know how prone these people are to evil. You know, I'm, I'm okay. Blame somebody else. Very classic. Children learn that. You know, you, you raise some kids. How, how, how early do they learn that? Real early. Especially if they have siblings. Yeah, it was her fault. It was his fault. Somebody's fault. Uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I saw a little meme, the, the old meme of the, the dog ate my homework. And then we've got a little thing about people eating uh, dogs, you know, and, sending, and, then, and then, you know, the people, the immigrant ate my dog. So, you know, it wasn't my fault. It's kind of a bad joke. Or the other one I saw was, <laughs> be, be quiet over there. <laughs> the other one. The, the, the kid who had technology brought in an x-ray screen and it showed the dog with his homework inside the dog. So, so anyway, we make excuses. We do what we can. They said to me, make us gods that will go before us. And as for this fellow Moses who brought us, we don't know what happened to him. So we can, we can uh, sin now. So that's what happened. And they gave me gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. How does that sound? That's like the dog ate my homework. So you understand what's going on? Aaron makes this excuse to Moses, said, well, they gave me the gold. I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Huh, how'd that happen? <laughs> you 
You know, we've heard it all from our kids. Well, they, it started way back when in Genesis. Yeah, right. The people had a choice. They made the wrong choice. Aaron, the leader in charge, he had a choice. He should have known better. He made the wrong one. And someone needed to say, stop. Moses will be back. God, God has shown us his power. Let's be true to God. I've told you this story before, but this truly is a bike trip one. But uh, Cowboy Jeff, who you know better than any of the other peddlers, He's a pretty rugged looking guy now, but you should have seen him when he was like 23. I mean, you wouldn't want to mess with him. He had these, these legs that just, <laughs> he was pretty strong in the mountains. But we were in Columbia at dark, at night, it was dark, and some, some kids came around us. And we, we, I mean, these were like teenagers. And we were kind of like looking around, and they, one of them grabbed Jim's uh, uh, canteen. And it's kind of like the, the song, Big John, and out of the dust and the smoke of that man made hell rose a giant of a man that the miners knew well. Grabbed a sag and timber and gave out with a groan like giant oak tree. just stood there alone, Big John. 1960, Jimmy Dean. I remember that one. That's not in the notes, Leonard. <laughs> but anyway, we had Jeff, Cowboy Jeff. And he just came out of that man made hell and he said, no, stop. Those kids dropped that canteen, and I swear they all, you know, I don't know where they went, but they were gone. <laughs> Somebody had to stop and say, no, you're not, you know, because canteen first, and then, then you know, your valuables, and he, no, no. Well, we don't all have, you know, Cowboy Jeff when he was 23, uh, but we need to make these decisions on our own. So stand up to the danger. Jeff did that. Peter tells a story like it's legend, and, 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 you know, Jeff, by the way, when he comes here October 13th, will disagree with the details, and I will say, Stoop, that was 50 years ago. Who cares about the details? That's the idea of the story. So Moses, Aaron, the golden calf say no. Uh, sometimes we need to make that. You, you remember who said the saying maybe 30 years ago, just say no? And was made fun of it. And, and not everything's, you know who I mean. Can you think of who that is? Wasn't it a president's uh, wife? Nancy. Yeah, Nancy. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Her husband was a great president. She got criticized for that. Just say no. And I understand with addiction and problems, it's hard just to say no. But it's still, it's still a good place to start. Just say no. How many of you in your life have made, you know, maybe it was a, an addiction, alcohol, drugs, or something, and you finally said, or maybe your wife, or your husband, just say no, and you did it. I mean, I've heard those stories from you. Uh, I've had time to say, no, not, no, stop, not going to go that way. That's the kind of spirit we need to have to, to follow the Lord. Make a choice. No, you're not going to teach my children that, some say. No, I'm not going to let you stand by and destroy the church with you know, theology that's unlike anything we've ever heard. No, not going to do that. Life choice, make a decision. How about the Apostle Paul? Terrible man. He was Saul. He was a persecutor. He became the great apostle. So Martin Luther, here I stand. You know, 500 years ago, here I stand. And, and so on. The choice between, so, summarizing those two. One to go, I'll be done in a minute. Choice between good and evil, that's number one. Number two, uh, whom do you serve? Got to serve somebody. And number three are just general life choices. And the example, I won't go through the whole of this because this is well known, but Stacy read the story of the Good Samaritan. And really the key to that is the people who are most likely to help did not help. And this is a convicting story for preachers, priests, rabbis, you know, presidents of the congregation. It's like the people you would think were going to help didn't, but the Samaritan. Well, the Samaritans were known as kind of half-breeds. They were half-Gentile, half-Jews. They were looked down upon in those days. So it was the Samaritan who came, and you know the story. You heard Stacy read it. Helped them, took them to, the, to help, said, if there's any expense, I'll be coming back and give you that. Did the right thing. And the question Jesus had was, to the Pharisees who, with whom he was speaking, which one's the neighbor, good neighbor? Well, given that choice, it'd be hard to say, well, that priest probably did pray for him, you know, <laughs> or that other person probably did have an important meeting. You know, I think they're, no, everybody kind of says, yeah, it's, it's the one to stop and help. So I think 
we have a challenge with that today because, you know, in today's world, we have professional people who, who need help. If you see a panhandler, I did a little study on panhandlers. There's a very small percentage of people at the street. We don't see them so much here, but in Spokane, very small percentage who really are in need. They're, they're what we call professionals. Now, it's hard to judge, you know, because this one may, may really need it. But it, what happens is for a lot of us Christians say, well, they're just panhandling, so I won't help anybody. And I, I used to remember um, people say, well, I don't want to, you, know, you know, I saw this TV ad at night and, you know, they, it was for children's world and, and, and help this poor child you see in Ecuador or something, only $20 a month. Well, that's wonderful. They are reaching people who don't go to church, but the percentage of your $20 that goes to help is very small, 10%, 20%. And I used to say, Lutheran World Relief, I, I, I hope it's still about the same, about 5% administrative, 95%. That's why when we gave a couple thousand, whatever it was, we actually built a school in the Philippines, and there was no middleman, there was no you know paying anybody off. We had little kids, six years old, carrying cement. That's how we want to help. We want to be direct, and we can't always do that, but as much as we can to help is directly and do the do the same thing. When I was a young pastor, I gave out a lot of five dollars. And when I was at my beach ministry, I gave out of like five and tens. People would say, "I'll pay you back." And after the sixtieth time that paid paid me back, and I hadn't had zero, I thought, "Huh." <laughs> Took me a while to say, "Huh." <laughs> so if I gave it to somebody, I said, "Don't say it. You're not going to pay me back. This is a gift. Don't even say it. Why lie?" You know so. But then we started saying, no money, you need gas, okay, voucher for $20, it's only going to work at that station there. And when you saw the disappointment in their eyes, you know, they were scamming, but there's ways to be smart. So just, I went on a little long, just getting back here, so I had all this pent-up energy. Life choices, uh, good and evil, whom do you serve, and then everyday choices that we make. And I'll just say, it's not easy, let Jesus... Show the way, as Leonard said to Gunner, just pray about it. Not easy. No magic formula. And as we leave here today, and for, for those of you online, Jesus shows the way. There's no magic, but if we follow the Lord, it's going to work out. In Jesus' name, amen.